a visit from Oscar usually meant right. that that person was going to die. Now, when that came out, uh, we got four English hospices who wrote to us to say they'd noticed exactly the same thing with their cats. So, hmm. obviously, cats have this sort of sense. Mm. It's just amazing. Barbara is in Washington, D.C. for Dr. Peter Fennick, The Art of Dying. Barbara? Thank you so much for taking my call. Um, I find it really interesting that every time uh, there's a program similar to this, it just ties in with what I'm going on in my life, that I turn it on. Uh, about a year ago, both my mom and my brother were diagnosed, uh, my mom terminal and my brother also. My brother, he quickly went into the hospital for two weeks, and then for two weeks we put him in the facility, and hospice came in. And um, he had um, cirrhosis and other things going on, so he was very jaundiced. And when he passed away, there were four of us around him, and it was it was really a um, heart wrenching and a beautiful experience at the same time. He went through all the steps that you spoke about, how when they pass, and their respiration slows down. And um, because he was very jaundiced, he he and he'd been under medication. He was rarely ever did his eyes open at the last few days. And when he did pass, the four of us were around him. We were stroking him and and just talking with him and helping him along. And he suddenly opened his eyes, and he looked up to the top of the room, and his eyes did open wider than they had been in the last month. His eyes, the whites of his eyes were white. They were no longer yellow. His eyes were as blue as you've probably ever seen in any pictures, that beautiful pictures of Christ. And he just looked up, and his eyes were so wide. And and then he just he let go. And I was wondering, with this, I, I felt like it was like an instant uh, healing that took place before he left because only two of us noticed that his eyes, the, the jaundice in his eyes right. were gone. Right. Very and it was just it was it was just a wonderful, wonderful experience and he did leave. And um now we're mom's hung on for all this time. It was a year ago on Halloween. We're, we're running out of time out. here. We're running out of time here, Barbara, and I'd really like to get a comment on that part of the story, so I'll just ask you to hang on and 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 ask Doctor Peter. What about that? Do you have I, any I other think stories? That- that, that is uh, just a wonderful story, and we got a number of accounts of this. This is a complete transformation which occurs actually at the time of death. And I very much like the idea that his eyes were bluer than they'd ever been. And right. this question of blueness does seem to, to come up. And In the, other the, words, the eyes do shine more brightly, and people are transformed. And, and just at that moment of death, he was well again for just the last few seconds. And that is reported over and over. The Art of Dying, Dr. Peter Fennick, who is a neuropsychiatrist, a scientist, and also somebody with an open mind looking at these unexplained phenomenon. Next on Coast to Coast AM, this is Ian Punnett. The Art of Dying, Dr. Peter Fennick. We will run the table on the calls that we have here as best as we can. Keep your stories short. And it'll be easier for us to get everybody on, if you can, next on Coast to Coast AM. This is Ian Punnett. In the first hour, somebody had called and asked, hey, when is Alex Jones going to weigh in on all of these uh, geopolitical stories in the news? He'll be on Wednesday, turns out, later on this upcoming week with George Norrie. And last week, when I was on Sunday night, an interesting call from a farmer in Canada that had cataloged a series of mutilations that had happened to uh, his livestock. Uh, He was relating them to lights that he was seeing in the woods. We passed along all that information to Linda Moulton Howe. I don't know if it'll be included in this upcoming show on Thursday, but she'll be on with George Norrie and the real X-Files this Thursday night on Coast to Coast AM. Back to Dr. Peter Fennick. 
neuropsychiatrist and author of the book, The Art of Dying, and uh, explaining his expertise. Uh, it would probably take too long here with all of the calls, but uh, suffice it to say, very well qualified to talk about various near-death phenomena. And John is in New York on Coast to Coast AM for Dr. Peter Fennick. John? Hello, Ian. Hello, Peter. How are you? Hi. Good evening. I got a question and a little comment here. The first thing, well, we'll reverse that here. Now, did you ever see the Twilight Zone episode when the clock actually died out and the old man died? Uh, no, I never saw that, but uh, go on. Okay. My comment is, now, every everything is in speculation. Now, when you have your the way you're practicing and what you're doing exactly, it's it, everything. You, you can have the Pope. You can have Harold Camping. You can have anybody in the world, but it is all speculation. So people got to understand that. I'm not trying to insult your intelligence. I'm not under sure. I don't understand what you're what you're saying there. I I, I think you may have missed. Some of the show, then, John. We did talk about the clocks earlier, um, and there is a whole chapter in the book. But when wow. you say when you say speculation, what do you mean by that? Well, what I mean is when he's saying like certain like it could be it could be anything from sleep deprivation, it could be anything. But he just puts certain things in a class that it just it's all speculation. When you die, this happens. It could be a lack of oxygen when you know people see things. Well, in the well, let's ask a better question. Let's let's actually ask that. And Dr. Fennick, is it could it just be lack of oxygen? Could it just be you know the somebody sitting on the bed funny? I mean, what 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 can we know about the science of this? Okay, I, I like John's question very much because um, as a scientist, one looks at all a full range of explanations, and it depends uh, really what we are going to talk about. Let's. Let's talk about, first of all, science and how you get data. The first stage of science is that you collect reports of a phenomenon. Then the next stage is you set out to see if you can collect these reports reliably. Then the third stage is that you make hypotheses from it. Now, what we're doing at the moment is we're collecting data. In other words, we're seeing what's out there. And what is out there is um, the uh, phenomena. Let's say, clock stopping or deathbed visions. So people tell us stories. Now, when we did our study, we did it in two bits. We talked to carers of the dying and said, tell us the stories that you've had told to you in the last five years. And so we got a lot of stories in. And then we said to the carers, we're going to come back in a year and tell us all the things that you've seen in the last year and heard repeated to you. So we then went back a year later, and this is called a prospective study, and we looked at what had actually happened during that year. And so that tightens up the data a bit. Now, the next step, and this is John's point, I think, is that supposing somebody is seeing a deathbed vision, uh, could it be due to confusion? Could it be due to um, the fact that because they're dying, their blood chemistry is upset? Could it be because they're not breathing properly, they're anoxic? All these sorts of questions now come into focus. Um, as far as the data that we've had at the moment, these uh, sets of explanations have mainly been discounted by the carers of the dying at the time. And one of the reasons for that is that in deathbed visions, the um, people are extremely clear, they're lucid, and that doesn't go with a confusional state that John is suggesting, but it's, um, it's one of the possibilities, but it doesn't seem to be the correct one at the moment. Now let's go to clock stopping. Do clocks stop? Well, you do exactly the same thing. You do a, a retrospective study and you get your stories, and then you take a number of deaths and you say, um, how many of these people had their clock stop? And then you actually set it up, and you can set it up with clocks in the room and things like that and see if the clocks stop when you're actually observing them. So there are levels of proof and levels of collecting data. At the moment, we're between the first and the second, and the third's yet to come. Uh, Vicky is in Kentucky on Coast to Coast AM for Dr. Peter Fennick. Vicki? Hi, uh, Peter and Ian. Hi, I'm a little nervous here. 
Uh, I took care of my uncle. He was uh, 82 years old. Uh, he wasn't on any kind of medicine or anything. And he went through a lot of different 